This happened to me about two years ago when I was 17. My family went out for the day to go shopping for food and I stayed home alone. I was in my room playing games on my PC with my headphones on and I always keep my door closed. So after about an hour I get up to use the bathroom. Both the bathroom and my room are on the second floor and our house at the time was a two-story detached house in West Belfast, Northern Ireland. So when I get back to my room I remembered closing the door and continuing playing games. About 30 minutes later I go to check my phone but realized I left it in the bathroom. I get up to get it and notice my door is open slightly. Now my house isn't drafty and I know the door is good and doesn't just open due to wind or whatever. So it catches me off guard. But I reason that I probably just didn't close it all the way and head out to get my phone. I come back and continued to play, making sure I close the door on my way back in. Sometime later I hear my family come back home. I hear them bringing the first load of shopping into the kitchen and go out to the car to get more. When they come back in they call my name and I head downstairs. When I came down I saw the back patio door was lying wide open. They asked me if I was out back at any point while they were away, and I told them that I wasn't. We looked outside and saw one of the deck chairs was pulled over to a lower part of the fence, facing a small area of woodland leading into another street. Obviously not where it should be. This shocked me. My mind raced with ideas of what the hell was going on. This is my own personal theory. Somebody had managed to get in, most likely through the back door. They had went to see if the house was clear, went upstairs, opened my door and saw me. Then they must have decided to wait downstairs for some reason. Maybe thinking I would leave or they could ambush me. But had gotten scared and hid when my family returned, using the fact that they had left the kitchen to bring in more shopping to slip out as fast as they could, and use the chair to get over the fence. Even with this idea, I don't understand why they would risk coming in, given it was in the middle of the day. Plus, if they had seen I had headphones on, why not just come up behind me and deal with me then? The worst thing about this is I have no concrete proof of what happened that day. I have no idea why someone came in, how they got in, or who they were. But one thing I feel certain about is that somebody did come in my house that day. There's more to this story. A week or so later, it's late at night, around 2 a.m. ish, and I'm in my room playing games. While playing, I end up drifting off to sleep. I am woken up by my mom coming in shaking me and asking me if I was outside. I told her no, I've been in here all night and I was asleep. She explains to me that while she was laying in bed, she heard the back door slam. And as her room is just above the kitchen and back door, she felt the shake of the slam. My stepdad was working night shift at the time, so it was only me, my mom, and my sister in the house. I go downstairs to see if everything's okay. The door is wide open. Our back garden is pitch black darkness, so not knowing if anyone was out there, I close it and lock it, and looked around the garden from inside with a torch. I don't see anyone outside and decide to stay downstairs for a few hours keeping a lookout. The next day we change the locks. The strange thing about both of these instances is that nothing was stolen. None of our things were missing and it seemed like nothing had been really moved or the drawers even looked through. I have absolutely no explanation for this and to this day it still baffles me. We had discussed getting the police involved but we felt because there was no serious evidence of a crime taking place and that we would be moving out of that house in a matter of weeks, unrelated to all of this, we decided there really wouldn't be anything that they could do to help. So we just had our locks changed and made absolutely sure to keep things locked and watched until we had moved out. A few years ago, my husband and I were remodeling our house. I had purchased my grandparents' old home after they had passed away, so we wanted to update it. We had gutted the living room and replaced the drywall. 
I had been sanding drywall mud off all evening, so my husband left for work. He was working thirds. I called it a day. I had all the doors and windows open, letting fresh air in and the drywall mud dust out. It was just me and my son who was eight at the time in the home. I had just gotten out of the shower when I heard a knock at the screen door. It scared me. It was 11 p.m. at night and our house was in the country. Our neighbors weren't screaming distance. There was a mobile home park about a mile and a half down the road and we never had anyone show up this late. There was a younger girl at the door. She couldn't have been more than 20. She was wearing shorts and a tank top. She asked to use our phone. She said someone was trying to kill her. I wouldn't let her in. I asked her if she wanted me to call the sheriff. She quickly said no. She just wanted to call someone to come and get her. I noticed she was holding a cell phone. She told me the battery was dead. I had two German shepherds standing on both sides of me. I told her she could use my phone, but couldn't come in because my dogs were trained to attack dogs. We can't let anyone in that doesn't know us or them. She looked freaked out. When I handed her a landline phone, she extended her arm out. That's when I saw it. She had track marks all up and down her arm. I think she was shooting up meth or whatever. She called her ride and not even two minutes later I see a car come down the side road. It was her ride. He was on a dead end street. As soon as they left I closed and locked down everything. I called my husband, my ex-husband, asked if I was overreacting before calling my husband at work, and I called the sheriff. I have never had anything like that happen before or since. I think they saw the house, it was isolated and had the exterior decor of an older person's home, and thought it would be an easy target to rob. Thank God I had my dogs, and I'm glad we didn't get to meet who was in her car picking her up. There is a house on a corner from where I grew up. This old house first came on my radar after my parents had divorced when I was around nine years old. My dad would pick my brother and I up every weekend and drop us off Sunday nights. One Sunday night he made a comment as we passed by the house. Every time I drive by that house it looks exactly the same. I was confused and we pretty much passed it before I could take a look. But he explained... The curtains are in the same spot. The porch light is always on and nobody is ever in the driveway. That next weekend we drove past the house and for the first time I saw it. Ordinary looking 90's single story home. The curtains were open on only the front window. Porch light was on. So for years as I grew up and my dad took us back to my mom's house I would always check the house to see if there was ever something different. Fast forward to me turning 16 and acquiring a license. It was an amazing time and I drove my car everywhere as first time drivers do. Feeling nostalgic, I drove back to the old house where my mom and my brother and I lived. The divorce really impacted me and I wanted to see our old house where we were once a family. Where my dad picked us up and dropped us off when we were no longer. I passed the strange house and continued my ritual. I was blown away. After all these years, it was still the same. One weekend, I gathered my high school buddies and we did some toilet papering. I told my friends about the house and we went and toilet papered it. This is the first time I got to look at it up close. At first glance through the windows, you could see a cross on the wall, a dark green sofa and a grandfather clock. We toilet papered it until a car passed by on the main road and we split. I went back there with one of my friends who toilet papered it with me, and the toilet paper was gone. The house still looked the same, no car, no toilet paper. So someone lives in there, or the neighbors cleaned it up. 
Fast forward to my 20s. I started dating a girl who I grew up with. On my commute to her place is this house. It's still the same. I pull over and do something incredibly stupid. I get out of my car and I walk up to the house and ring the doorbell. I figured I could tell them how their house had been an ongoing joke with my dad and friends and I wanted to clear the air. Across the street I hear a door shut and I turn around. The neighbor across the street beelines towards me and meets me at the porch of the strange house. Can I help you? Confused, I explained to him the story. He seemed to be looking around funny, at me, at the house, and at his surroundings, as if he wasn't really listening to me. He seemed like a rough blue-collar kind of guy and reeked of booze. Well, nobody's home, is literally all he said and walked back to his driveway, got in his red pickup, and drove off. At my girlfriend's, I told her the story of the house and about the guy, and she even thought it was odd. My girlfriend and I did the deed and I left her place at 3 a.m. Exhausted, I rolled the windows down and blasted some red hot chili peppers, as one does in their 20s. I noticed a car behind me and we entered a residential area so I turned down the music. It's a red truck. My heart sinks. I make some weird turns and it was definitely following me. I jump on the freeway and lose him. I swore to never go anywhere near that house ever again, but I was angry and I had questions. I gathered my buddy from high school and we stalked that shit out for hours. We started Saturday 3pm. Around 9pm that guy in the red truck walks across the street, unlocks the front door of the strange house, sits on the dark green couch and stared at the window as he seemed to be talking. He then disappeared into the house garage door opens minutes later. He walks out of the house with more people than he walked in with, and they get into a car parked on the street and driveway. The neighbor guy then locks back up the house and goes across the street into his house. Was this a halfway house? A brothel? We had so many questions. The house still looks the same from the looks of Google Images, I still have no closure and it bothers me. What could this be? Why was this house so staged? Human trafficking? Yes, this state is near the border, 40 through 50 miles away from the border. However, I do not feel this theory carries any weight. The people who walked out with the neighbor were all adult white men. They all seemed geeky, almost dad-like. I'd like to suspect that this was possibly a place for some sort of AA meetings or possibly some sort of group or business being operated out of a home. Maybe that's why the neighbor was so unpleasant, as he wanted to keep it low key to possibly avoid legally running a business, for reasons such as taxes, licenses, regulations, and so on. It just has eerie vibes. What are your thoughts? As far as the toilet papering goes, I was a teenager. I think we all did some pretty stupid and pretty awkward things in high school. Honesty and integrity are everything. I straightened out my act as I matured and work as a firefighter paramedic and contribute to society. I'm a 32 year old female and this is something that happened to me only two nights ago. My husband Kevin and I were on the porch smoking a cigarette. It was about 9 o'clock at night. We live in the woods, right off of a stretch of a highway that's between two interstate exits. We were looking up to the stars, enjoying the quiet atmosphere of the crickets, glad to have a temporary relief from the usual traffic noise. I heard something and shushed my husband, even though he hadn't said anything. Was that screaming? Yes, it was a woman screaming like nothing I had ever heard before. It sounded like she was getting murdered. In between blood chilling screams she was screaming out, help me. I look at my husband. We were both really freaked out. The more she screamed, the closer she was getting to the house. 
I could eventually see a figure running along the medium of the highway making their way closer to the part of the highway that was in front of our house. Our house is a good ways back from our driveway, but not far enough that you can't see anything. If we could see her, that meant she could see us. Me being selfish and worrying about my three children in the house, one of which was a newborn, I turned the porch light off. We had no yard security lights. Stupid, I know. So we were in complete darkness. We could still see the highway perfectly fine due to the houses across from us who still had up their Christmas lights. I threw my cigarette in the yard and back up to stand in the doorway of the house, pulling out my phone to call 911. She is still in the medium of the road, screaming. If anyone else in the surrounding houses heard her, they pretended like they didn't. Kevin runs past me inside to get his jacket and shoes. I tell him not to go out there, but he ignores me and gets dressed anyway. As soon as he's out of sight, I see a red car barrel up the driveway and pull up next to where the lady's at. With her in the medium, there was still a stretch of highway between them. There was a man that was driving. I couldn't see what he looked like. I only heard his voice. He was yelling that he was going to kill her and called her a bitch. It looked like he was throwing stuff at her out the window. Maybe clothes. As soon as she sees him pull over, she starts running straight towards our yard. By that time, I was already on the phone with the police officers, but as I said, I lived out in the woods. Pretty far out of town, I'll add. So it would just take them a bit longer to get there. I yell for my husband. I tell my nine-year-old son to get in our room where the baby is and close the door. He can hear the whole thing and was pretty frightened. My husband runs out onto the porch and into the yard towards her. He asks if she's okay, and she says that she had gotten a ride home from this guy and halfway down the road he started acting really creepy. He refused to let her out, where she told him, and kept driving with her in the car. She looked behind her seat, pretending to look at a car behind them and saw a roll of duct tape. Fearing for her life, she jumped out of the moving car and started running down the road screaming for help. Kevin starts to lead her towards the house and by now is also on the phone calling the police, having gathered more information that I was unable to give them when I had called. They told him to stay on the line with them until an officer showed up. He lets her into the house and her face looks terrible. She is red and bleeding in a couple of spots, road rash from when she jumped out. She also said that he had hit her before she was able to escape. She came in and we locked the door, knob, deadbolt, and chain. We stood together near the window waiting for the police to show up. Kevin giving updates and answering the questions on the phone. No, they haven't gotten here yet. Yes, his car is still parked across the highway. It's a red sedan in front of the house with a lot of blue porch Christmas lights, he told them. I was trying not to lose my shit when there was a very loud bang on our door. The man was yelling, I know you're in there. I saw you running. The people in there can't protect you. I shouted through the door that he needed to leave our property, and if he was smart to get in his car and drive off. I told him we were on the phone with the police. The answer he gave was the worst one I could have heard. He says, Go ahead. Call the police. I don't care. They won't be here in time. And started banging on the door over and over. The woman was freaking out and crying, saying, Help me! Over and over again. I ran to the kitchen to get a large knife, just in case. We had a huge solid iron door, but our windows were easily breakable. If he wanted to get in badly enough, he certainly could. My husband just came from our bedroom with his gun when a squad car pulled up into the yard, two more following behind it and one across the street where the car was. He took off on foot and started running. They tended to the woman and got her home safely. Turns out she lives across the highway from us, five houses to the left. It had been two hours later and they still hadn't found him. There are a lot of places he could be in these woods. I just hope he hides far enough away from here. This happened years ago when I was 19. I'm now in my mid-twenties. 
I still remember this very clearly because of how creeped out I was. Back then I was living 600 plus miles away from my parents in a different state. Even though there was a distance, my mom and I still talked on the phone at least twice a week and we were still really close. So when we found out her cancer was back, I didn't think twice about dropping everything to drive down and see her. A plane ticket would be too expensive, and I had a 10 year old Toyota that might have been a bit beat up but still got me from A to B cheaply and quietly. My parents weren't thrilled at the idea of me driving the 11 hours by myself, but my mind was made up. So they offered me a deal. I would stop at a rest stop every two or three hours and stretch my legs and call them, and in exchange for this courtesy, they would pay for my gas. If I didn't call within three hours, they would assume I'd been in an accident and call me repeatedly, interrupting the audiobook and podcast that they knew I would have on. I accepted the deal. And that's why I was at this particular rest stop at 2.45 a.m. This was actually one of the nicer stops. Well lit, multiple vending machines that didn't have huge cages around them, the payphone wasn't broken, and it looked clean. There were a couple of cars here and there, and people sleeping in them. I still had 15 minutes before I had to check in with my parents. I got out of my car and stretched, and then almost jumped out of my skin when I heard a man's voice right behind me. Miss, can I ask you for a favor? I turned around and he's leaning against my car. I have no idea how he got there so fast. I didn't see him when I parked. But there he was, uncomfortably close to me. He looked like he's in his 40s. He didn't look dirty or twitchy. He was too close, but his body language didn't scream threatening. And even though I was only 19 years old, barely over 5 foot at that point in my life, 110 pounds soaking wet, and even though I had already binged on a ton of true crime media, and knew the dangers of a girl my age alone at night with an out of state license plate, my dumb ass asked what he needs. He told me that he accidentally locked his keys and his phone in his truck, and could he borrow my phone really quick to call his friend. It would take just a second and it would really help him out and I almost handed him my phone. I was reaching into my pocket to hand it to him with a Pollyanna no problem, and then I actually looked at his face. Like I said, this rest stop was surprisingly well lit, and this guy looked really normal. Except for his eyes. He had dead shark eyes. You know what I'm talking about. It's like Ted Bundy, Dick Cheney, Actress in a Glade commercial who is trying to convince us she's in love with a dumbass who doesn't know how air freshener works eyes. They're smiling, but the eyes are vacant and creepy and staring way too hard. I got that feeling, that runaway feeling. I knew immediately not to hand this guy my only way to call for help. So I put on my best customer service smile and told him, Oh my god, I'm so sorry, but I don't have a charger and I need to save all my battery for the tracking app my parents have on my phone. And I need all that juice to call my parents, which I actually have to do right now. But good luck! And I turned and walked away about 20 feet. And he doesn't leave. He was still just leaning on my car, watching me. And now I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to leave him alone with my car because he creeped me out and he had a serial killer face. So going to the bathroom is out. But I also wanted to get away from him. Prove I'm not going to help and maybe he'll leave. I could technically get into my car, but I would have to get really close to him unless I crawled over my passenger side seat. And he's not moving. So I did the first thing that popped into my mind. I called my dad. And my dad, for the first time that night, didn't pick up the phone. When I heard his voicemail, I glanced back. The guy still hadn't moved. He was still just staring at me. So I faked a phone conversation with my dad. I angled my body so that the guy couldn't see that I had hung up on the phone and loudly said that I should be home in about 30 minutes, when in reality I was still at least four hours away. I mentioned exactly where I was and reassured the fake caller that this was a good rest stop with plenty of lighting and a couple of visible security cameras. The guy still hadn't moved, and I'm running out of steam on this fake conversation. 
In the years since, I've thought a lot of things I could have said while pretending to talk to my dad, but in that moment I was beginning to seriously freak out, and my mind went blank. So I hung up and didn't know what to do. I had hoped the fake call would scare him off, but he was still leaning against my car. I stalled for another couple of minutes. I bought cookies from the vending machine. I walked around a little. At this point, he's been leaning against my car staring at me for at least 10 minutes. I honestly debated waking up one of the sleeping men in their parked cars and asking for help. And just thought of having to wake someone up to help me out and get into my own damn car annoyed me, so I stopped stalling and headed back to my car. I decided that unless he touched me, I'm going to pretend he isn't there. He waited until I was unlocking my car door before he started talking to me again. He told me again that he really needs to use my phone. He's stranded here unless he can call his friends to bring the spare keys. He's not angry or begging. His voice sounds weirdly friendly, but he just kept creepily watching me for way too long while blocking my exit, so I'm not falling for it. I almost pointed out the working payphone, just in case I'm wrong about this and I was being a bitch to a guy who needs help. But then he leaned forward as I was getting in and I lost all nerve and slammed and locked the door as fast as possible. He didn't move until I started the car and put it in reverse and then he finally stepped back and let me pull out. I didn't even have my seatbelt on. I was so focused on getting away from him. And then halfway out of the rest stop, my mom called me. My mom who would freak out if I didn't pick up and who was already sick. And I needed to put on my seatbelt. I could still see him in my mirror. He was standing right next to where I had parked with his back to me. He was far enough away that I felt okay parking again to answer the phone, but I kept my engine running and I kept watching him. I don't want my mom to worry, so I told her everything is fine, where I am, my ETA. Now that I was in my locked car away from him, I was beginning to feel like I had overreacted. She scolds me about speeding and I tune her out because the guy is moving now. As my mom lectures me about road safety, I watch the guy cross to a truck unlock the door and get in. The keys being locked in no longer seemed to be an issue for him. I watched the truck head back out to the freeway and drive out of sight. I had to pretend to be fine not to upset my mom. I didn't get back onto the road for another 20 minutes, and when I did, I didn't speed. I didn't want to see his truck. I found out years later that the closest city to that rest stop has a major problem with sex trafficking, and that the girls who look like they don't live nearby, or maybe look like they are living out of their cars, tend to be targets. I don't know if that was what was happening, or if he was just trying to scare me into handing over my phone. Either way, creepy guy at the rest stop. Let's not meet. So this actually happened to me last night. I'm still pretty shaken up by the experience and promptly quit this shitty part-time job right after. I work at a retail store in a not so nice part of town. Since the area isn't the best, not many people ever come into the store and even less people come in at night. Something important to note is that the store does not have any cameras nor does it have a panic button. So basically anyone could do anything and we have had many people steal things here and there. Looking back, this should have been my first clue to quit as soon as possible. Working this night shift was me, a very small girl, and my co-worker, basically the exact height and build as me. We were joking around and playing on our phones because it was about 7.30pm and no one had come in for about an hour. Suddenly a group of people, two men and one woman, come in all at once. A side note about these people, they were all wearing black head to toe, facial tattoos, and were very confrontational upon arrival. The woman was a very husky woman, and I was honestly very intimidated by her. Her friends, the two men, were at least six foot each, towering over both me and my co-worker who were both five foot three. 
One of the men immediately asks us what our ages were and complimented me on my smile. I'm kind of awkwardly laughing and trying to be as kind as possible to get these people to leave fast. The woman basically corners my coworker over in one of the aisles so she's unable to walk over to where I am, which is right behind the counter. The woman is basically yelling at my coworker asking her, Why don't you hire me? I need to work. Hire me. Pretty much scaring the both of us. While this is going on, one of the men walks over and blocks the door. The other man comes up to the counter and looks at the $100 through $300 items we have stocked behind the counter, and jokes to his friend about how he needs all of these items. He then turns to me and says with a deadpan face, Give me everything. I awkwardly laugh and say, Everything? He then says nothing and continues to stare right into my face for five more seconds before repeating, Everything. So I did just that. I start to take things off the shelves while he points to things saying, Give me that, and that, and that. He then stops and says, You never asked me how I was going to pay for any of this. The entire time his friends are saying nothing and standing still while staring at me. The man then breaks his stare and laughs, prompting his buddies to laugh along with him and states that they were going to come back. As soon as they leave, I make a beeline to the door and lock it. I call my manager and tell them what had happened, and I'm begging her to let us close up because I do not want these people to come back. As if on cue, they come back and yank on the door, which is locked, and continue to yank on it. I tell my coworker to run with me to the back and we lock the back room door and call the police. By the time the police arrive, they are gone, and nothing could be done because of the lack of cameras in the store. The police stayed outside the store in their cars until we closed and walked me to my own car. Throughout this whole ordeal, no one was in the store besides my coworker and I. My theory was that they were scoping out the situation before leaving and coming back with a firearm to actually carry out the robbery. Luckily I had locked the door the moment they stepped out. I don't like to think what could have happened if I had brushed it off and decided to leave the store open but I was shaking like a leaf when they left, and they hadn't really tried to do anything at all, so I trusted my gut feeling. So anyway, let's never meet again. I quit that shitty job. Thank you for being the catalyst to push me to finally leave. I have lots of creepy encounters during my travels but I'll start with the most recent one. Last year I went to Egypt with a big group of 40. For one night we stayed at this beautiful villa-styled hotel on top of the mountains. The layout for this particular hotel is a very long pool in the middle surrounded by small villas with about 20 rooms per villa. Our group got assigned to the farthest villa from the lobby. It was around 10 p.m. when I decided to go out for a walk to watch the stars and all. My grandma, who I was sharing the room with, was tired and went to sleep early, so I went out by myself. I walked around the pool, enjoyed the weather and the stars. I sat on one of the benches by the poolside. It was then I noticed one of the hotel staff, a bag porter who had helped us with our luggage when we checked in, approaching me. I thought nothing of it, but he came by and made small conversation. I brushed it off as him just trying to be friendly and courteous to guests. He asked where we came from and I answered politely. What he said next to me gave me the creeps. He said his friend was actually looking for a wife from my country. Uh, okay dude. I laughed it off and lied that I was married. He asked me where my husband was. I kind of panicked and told him my non-existent husband got left behind because he had work. He took out his phone and called someone, but I guess the person he was calling wasn't picking up. He told me to wait, but my spidey senses were tingling on overdrive. I had two options, to walk back to the villa as quickly as possible but risk letting this man know the room where I was staying at with my grandma or walk towards the well-lit lobby, hoping that there were people from my group still there. I stood up and started walking fast to the lobby. 
The man was still trying to call someone on his phone and tried to call after me, but I waved goodbye hurriedly. When I got to the lobby, I was relieved to see our tour leader, our Egyptian tour guide, and probably three ladies from our group still there. No more creepy hotel staff. Or so I thought. In the hotel lobby, there were a bunch of souvenir shops set up. One of the ladies I was close with, Barbara, was browsing inside the papyrus souvenir shop. Our guide warned us beforehand that the papyrus painting they sell at the hotel was fake, or just generally low-quality tourist trap souvenirs. So I went inside the shop to tell Barbara about that, in case she forgot. Inside the shop was Barbara, me, and two salesmen. One of them was standing near the door and blocking the only means of exit. Barbara asked for my opinion between two paintings and this salesman standing in front of us told us that these paintings have a different pattern that glows in the dark. He asked us if we wanted to see. I firmly said no before Barbara could answer. I had enough for the day and just wanted to go back to our room. However, this persistent salesman said something to this other man standing beside us, who then proceeded to close the door and flick the light switch. Fuck. Maybe I'm just paranoid, but I do not like the idea of being in a pitch dark room with two men I do not know. I could also sense that Barbara was panicking and she held on to my wrist. Like an angel in disguise, the door suddenly opened from outside and it was Barbara's aunt, who was also in the lobby with our tour guide, who shouted at us and asked us what we were doing. She motioned for us to come out quickly. I swear I do not know what would have happened if Barbara's aunt hadn't opened the door at that time. She made a fuss over it and the rest of the group walked back to the villa together with our tour leader. On the way to the villa, Barbara's aunt asked us if anything happened, if our phones and wallets were still with us and all that. We checked our belongings and everything was fine. No one followed us back to the villa and I was so happy that we were also checking out the next morning. Disclaimer, this is not meant to generalize or talk ill of a country. It just happened to be in Egypt. It doesn't mean that Egyptians are creepy, but those hotel staff we encountered, regardless of nationality, acted creepy and unprofessional. This story isn't one of mine, but was told to me by my parents. My parents, one of my sisters, and I all own houses within a mile of each other in a very ritzy gated community in Orange County, California, called Coto de Casa. We always visit each other, especially when we have a problem or need help with something. I grew up in this community, and violent crime is something that is virtually non-existent. If it does exist, it's typically a domestic violence within a household. I am now 32 and my parents are in their mid to late 60s. While growing up, my parents made sure every door and window was locked, like doing so was some sort of religion. I always questioned this policy asking, what's the point of locking the doors and windows when we live in an isolated suburb like this? Hell, there were many occasions where I didn't have a key and literally had to walk miles to a friend's house to wait for 5 hours in the yard just to be able to get into my house. It was quite annoying. One night one or two years ago, my parents awake to someone pounding on their door at 2 a.m. after falling asleep watching SNL. My dad goes to answer the door thinking it's my sister or me needing help and opens the door without looking out the peephole. He was shocked to see a very angry 19-year-old male. The kid starts telling my dad that he needs to get the hell out of his house. My dad tells him that he must be confused because this is our house and not the kids. My mom is in the other room hearing the back and forth between the two. My dad is apparently arguing with the very frustrated angry kid to no avail, and it is escalating fast. The kid simply cannot fathom the logic that this isn't his house, and my dad has no way to convince him otherwise. Now let me interrupt and describe my dad here. He has been an engineer his whole life. He may look old and nerdy, but he is always fixing cars, houses, electrical issues, building furniture, doing yard work, etc. 
He is actually still much stronger than me, as evident when we work on cars together. So, after about five minutes of circular logic, I mean, how many times can you tell someone this isn't their house and have them disagree with you? The kid in a fit of rage decides to barge his way into the house and my dad gets into a scuffle with him. My dad is punching, pushing, and kicking the kid and taking many blows himself. Finally, he was able to push the kid outside and close and lock the door. This is when the kid goes nuts. He decides to go around the entire house, pounding and banging on every door and window. My parents are scared shitless and terrified that he's going to break through a window or bust down a door because he is pounding so hard. This is the time my parents decided to pick up the phone and call the cops. While waiting for the cops to get there, my parents are completely defenseless, having no gun or weapon to protect themselves if this kid was able to break in. My mom is terrified because they could never tell where he was going to start banging and kicking next and described how she was amazed the windows weren't breaking because the kid was hitting them with extreme force. The cops finally get there. They find the kid in the backyard banging on one of the back doors and have to tase the kid to get him to stop and put him in restraints. After a while, they were able to figure out what had happened. The kid was extremely high on bath salts. The kid's older brother was supposed to be house-sitting for the neighbor next door but the older brother decided to pawn it off on his 19-year-old brother, who proceeded to throw a party at the house that was supposed to be watched. At some point, he left the house and was so high on bath salts he got confused on which house he was supposed to be house-sitting. My dad was bleeding in several places and was pretty bruised everywhere. The cops asked if he wanted to press charges, but my family said they were afraid to ruin the kid's life over an incident related to drugs. I thought they were being a bit too nice in this situation, but I guess it's their choice. My family doesn't talk very much about their emotions. Apparently, the realization that you cannot guarantee the safety of your home even with religiously locked doors and windows in a gated community was quite upsetting for them. The psychological after effects of this ordeal are pretty apparent, as they are coming out in other ways. For example, my parents installed a very expensive high-tech security system within a week or two of the event, and I could tell they were rattled by this event for a while, but just didn't want to admit the fact that the situation could have been a lot worse had my dad been traveling for work or not been able to overtake the high kid. Oh yeah, another interesting fact of this story is that the kid who attacked my parents and his brother live with their parents directly behind me, about a mile away from my parents and their neighbor's house the house they were supposed to be watching. I was nearly 13 years old and was being raised by my grandparents. We lived in a little tourist town in Florida. They had had problems with their two daughters as adults, my mom being the older of the two, and they wanted to do everything they could to make sure I didn't turn out the same way. A do-over, if you will. So, needless to say, they were very strict. My aunt was having a good period. She had her shit together. We were all very close. My aunt understood what it was like to be raised under a glass dome, metaphorically speaking. So, being as she was my only aunt, she made sure that the time we spent together was super cool. I would stay over Saturday nights. We would go and hang out at the pier and she would let me hang out with my middle school boyfriend who would find ways to get to wherever I was. My grandparents had no idea of any of these activities, of course. I was just spending some quality time with my aunt and giving them a break. It was nice that I had a younger female figure since my mom wasn't around. One night when we were out having fun, my aunt meets this guy and they really hit it off. He was really nice and introduced himself to me. He went by JR, and at first was a kind and charming talker. They exchanged numbers after hanging out a while, and then we went home and went to bed. They ended up going out a bit, and my aunt really liked JR. He took her to his home and introduced her to his father and showed her around his land. He lived out in the woods, in the middle of nowhere. I have lived in this town for 30 years and I still to this day can't tell you where it is. 
I was only there once. He was teaching my aunt how to shoot a gun. I remember her shoulder rocking back with the impact of the shot and it surprising her. He had these weird flamenco dancing clothes in his closet. It was all seemingly harmless. I mean, everyone has their quirks. About 10 days to maybe two weeks later, we were again at the pier out by the payphones talking about what to do that night and what to get for dinner. JR and my aunt were in their late 20s, early 30s, and as much as she loved me, I imagine there were times I got in the way. Well, anyway, we're at the pier and he's talking about how he has these painkillers. He offers me one. I declined, of course, and told him I had a high tolerance to pain anyway and didn't need that stuff. He then, with a huge smile, asks me if he can see for himself, assuring me he won't really hurt me. He's just trying to have fun. This bastard twisted my arm behind my back until I hear a pop. I start to cry and he laughs and says, Oh, sweetheart, I was only playing. You said you had a high tolerance. I guess I was stronger than I thought I was being. I'm sorry. No need to ruin the good time we are all having. I go into the private peer office, which my granddad managed, crying. My aunt comes in and tells me that she thinks it's fucked up too and that she talked to him about it. She goes back outside and he asks her what she is up to for the night. She tells him that she wasn't sure if I was staying over because of what had just happened. I was whining about going home. I was pissed she hadn't decked him right there for hurting me. Well, he tells her that she should meet him under the sunset bridge at 2am on the other side of town. He says that the stars are beautiful and you can listen to the fish. He tells her that he would love to see it with her and they can dance under the moon. We were all from a fishing family and live in a fishing town, so fish activities under the bridge at late times wasn't necessarily something that threw up a red flag. If it's dark and late, there won't be people hogging up all of the fish. She tells him maybe, and then we leave. I decided to spend the night after all, later sneaking in only if she will pick up my boyfriend Charlie, playing on my guilt points. She calls him before we get home, before we made our arrangements about Charlie and says that she can come, but she will have me with her. He groans and is like, Fine, alright. I guess she can come too. Maybe she will get tired and sleep in the car. About an hour after she called him the first time, I ask her about Charlie and she agrees. She sits down with me and hugs me and touches my face lovingly apologizing for what had happened with my arm. She then calls him again and tells him not to worry. She's picking up Charlie, so I will have my own entertainment and they can have their time. He goes into a rage and starts sputtering and cussing about how it's too complicated now, and he just wanted an intimate meeting with her and not a damn family reunion. He went on about how he didn't want to have to babysit a 13-year-old kid and her 14-year-old boyfriend. He hangs up after calling her a crazy bitch. She bewilderingly hangs up the phone and tells me what happened. We go about our night with pizza rolls and PlayStation and things are fine. He calls her a few more times and drives by the house for a couple of weeks. But my aunt was having none of it. After a while, he left our lives just as swiftly as he had came. The whole affair lasted only a month, if even that. Three weeks maybe and all in all it wasn't the craziest experience she had had with the man. JR was soon forgotten and we went about our business. Flash forward to two years later. I am almost out of middle school. My aunt had moved to a city about 40 miles away. I still lived with my grandparents. They were still strict, but as they had gotten older, so had I. I knew a few ways around the rules. One day my friend Frank and I missed the bus home from school and called our good high school friend Darla to pick us up and take us home after riding a bit. She had this big, beautiful red truck, and I would ride around in the cab of it loving the freedom and the wind. We were smoking cigarettes and laughing and listening to the radio. The time I would have spent on the bus before my stop was just enough time to hit up the taco drive through We cruised down the road a bit before heading back to Frank and Mai's house. We had a lot of fun that day. She dropped me off first. 
my grandparents came outside. They were heavily confused at the sight of an unknown vehicle and even more so when they saw that I had gotten out of it. After letting her be the one to explain because she was older, cooler, and more responsible, my grandparents thanked her for being kind enough to take me home. They said how lucky I was that she just happened to be there to help me get home. The things we do to our guardians, eh? That was the last time I ever saw my friend. She didn't show up for work for five days. I can't speak for everyone, but I assumed she had just ran away. Darla's parents were going through a nasty divorce. The dad had a hot new girlfriend and the mother was very bitter about it. Rightfully so, I guess. It was embarrassing for all of the kids. Her truck wasn't left behind. I figured she had gotten tired of her parents acting like infants and took off. I missed her, but she was in a whole other league of freedom and coolness. Sixteen is a whole different life than fourteen, especially when you're in different schools. I wished her well, maybe even a little envious she got out of this town and I was still here. When at about nine at night, my grandparents got a phone call to turn on the news. Darla's body was found in the woods. She had been strangled to death and just left out there. I don't even know for how long. I was devastated. I was so joyful that I had that last experience with her, but so saddened and horrified. She was so young, barely older than myself. She was about to be 17 in just a short time. It was a very sad time for our town. The good and bad news is they caught the guy that had done it. He confessed after confronted with some very incriminating evidence, and during his questioning also confessed to killing his girlfriend who had been missing for about eight years, and also his father, staging his death to look like a suicide by hanging. When they showed his mugshot on the screen and said his name, I swear I almost passed out. There, clear as day on the screen, staring back at me, was a picture of J.R. I had no idea they even knew each other. I can't even imagine what would have happened if we would have gone under that bridge that night. Investigation Discovery Channel did a piece on it a couple of years back. I was shocked to see it on TV. The memories came rushing back and I decided to write them all down. I literally have a newfound appreciation of life now that I'm old enough to understand just how close I could have come to being killed. I have a beautiful life with my husband and three boys that most likely wouldn't have happened if things had gone differently that night. I wish this was just some ridiculous post, but it isn't. My roommate tried to kill me tonight, and I'm in the emergency room as we speak while the police are on their way to arrest him. It all started when I reconnected with this kid a few months ago. We'd known each other for years, but haven't hung out too much. This past summer we started to hang out much more often after not seeing each other for over five years, going to the gym, clubs, and bars together, and having a good time. First warning sign was when his girlfriend broke up with him after one month and told me he had extreme bipolar and anger issues and that he wasn't taking his meds. I brushed it off but remained close friends with her since I knew her before him. We got an apartment together. Oh, what a mistake. He acted like a child. He never cleaned. All he did was work and play video games all day. And talk about how he was going to be a cop and make it one day. Which I find pretty ironic. After his girlfriend broke up with him, first week of apartment, I had a bunch of my friends over and we had a housewarming party. He drank a whole bottle of Hennessy to the face in 20 minutes, left to go see her and beg for her back, and ended up driving with alcohol poisoning. We called the police and he was caught, but didn't get a DUI because he was parked. His aggression then started to come out. On Thanksgiving, we got into a brawl because he didn't want the puppy we had for three days anymore and wanted to put it on Craigslist. Last week, I confronted him about lying constantly to everyone about every detail of his life. 
He's also a pathological and compulsive liar, I should add. He ran at me, got in my face, and then punched a hole in my door. Today was the Patriots parade. My team. Me, six friends, and his ex all went up together and had a great time. I posted a picture of all of us on Snapchat. And when he saw it, he said, I hope you're not home when I get home because I'm going to kill you. I laughed it off and kicked back watching a movie I was meaning to see. I'm a laid-back kid, happy, funny, and never looking for a fight, but will fight if need be. Then it happened. He came in with his keys wrapped around his knuckles and jumped on me while I was just chilling on the couch. He pounded my face and when I went to push him my shoulder dislocated, making me incapable of defending myself as he went to town on my face for what seemed like forever. I've had instability issues from a previous dislocation. He hit me until there was blood all over his knuckles and started to choke me out for what felt like a long time. He said, I'm going to snap your neck and fucking kill you. So I snapped my head back into his face and broke his nose. When I looked at him, he had crazy eyes. We started shoving back and forth and my fight or flight kicked into the max and I rushed him against the wall and got a couple of good hits in. He then put a video of me grabbing my stuff to leave frantically and put it on his Snapchat story, which was taken down soon after since his friends probably told him to. I went to the station and told them everything while adrenaline was rushing through my veins like continuous waves. He's now getting charged with assault and battery with a weapon, attempted murder, and three other charges. I'm getting a restraining order, and he's getting arrested now as we speak at his parents' house. So far my eye is black and blue with severe swelling and I have a concussion, but I'm glad that's all that happened as it could have been much worse. Moral of this story? You never really know the true nature of some people. They may have some masks they wear to allow them to have completely different characteristics, but beneath those masks can be a complete psychopath. Update 1. Spent a long time in the hospital, but I'm all set. Could have been much worse. Went to court today for the restraining order, but they brought him in in cuffs. He has a bunch of charges, including attempted murder. He lied to them about small things like the amount of time I knew him, that he didn't hit me with his keys, etc. I just told them the truth and what he said wasn't even true. He gave himself a black eye between the time he got home and the cops got him, but everyone in the courtroom was jaw-dropped when they saw my face. Got a complete restraining order on him as well. Also found out he's had multiple dismissed juvenile offenses as well. Update 2. I was able to get a clean break from the lease. He has a restraining order for the apartment area, so he can only go get his stuff once, but will have to continue to pay the full amount of the lease for two more months which isn't cheap. I lost my half of the security deposit due to circumstances to him, but it's better than living in fear that him or his goon loser friends will break in with their keys and get me in the dead of night. Update 3. He's not a Pats fan. Us Pat fans have class. This happened back in 2016, but it still gives me the creeps. Let me set the scene. It's a Friday night in Edinburgh and I'm skipping down the road looking forward to the highlight of my week, sticking on replays of King of the Hill and ordering fish and chips. I put a tenor on the heating, find a solid cough playlist on YouTube and order my food. All stations are go for another spectacular Friday night. Now it's worth mentioning that it was December in Edinburgh, so there was a lot of snow and I expected the food to take a little longer than usual. However, hours passed and it never arrived. No worries, I'll just cancel the order and make some pasta or something. I get a knock on the door at 1.30am, which was a little weird as I didn't buzz anybody into the building. I look through the people and there is a delivery driver. I opened the door and he began to profusely apologize for the delay in the food order and explained he felt bad and wanted to check if I wanted the food anyway. 
I told him I understood and that it wasn't a problem and took the food. I thought that was the end of what seemed like a happy matter. But it was not. At around 2am I get a text message saying, I really liked your sweatshirt. I responded, thanks, but who is this? He replies, it's your delivery driver. At this point I'm pretty annoyed at the nerve of this man, but also spooked as it was clear I lived alone and this man had sauntered straight up into my building. I can't remember everything he said, but it's more or less along the lines of, So how's your night? And various other fairly inoffensive messages to which I did not respond. The scary part is waking up at 3am to a series of missed calls with a message in the middle saying, I'm outside your building, do you want to hang out? I'm seriously shitting bricks at this point so I don't manage to get back to sleep until around 7 in the morning. Thankfully, I never heard from him again. I've since changed my sacred ritual, and my country of residence. This happened to me back when I was 17 and living in a small rural village. I had been at a friend's all evening watching films and chilling, and I left to go home around 11pm. It was quite a long walk back to mine as she lived on the outskirts of the village down some back roads. I felt relatively safe, as when it got to a certain time of night it was quiet. You wouldn't bump into anybody and there would hardly be any cars on the road especially at that late hour. It was weirdly peaceful. Where I live there was a large avenue with two big blocks of houses like two big circles that you would get to after following a small dark road that consisted of a few large old houses and a vicarage. As I'm passing the vicarage, I see this little beat up red Nissan Micra coming towards me. The closer it gets, the more it slows down and the guy is nearly breaking his neck trying to look at me. I mean, there was nothing subtle about it. It nearly came to a full stop as it drew alongside of me, and I started to panic. There was not another soul about, just me and this strange guy. I was determined not to get myself in a tiz, so I picked up the pace and refused to look at him. As far as I know, he drove off. I continued walking, which was literally a five minute straight line from there, and I kept listening out for a car engine and was vigilant of any headlights creeping up behind me. I heard nothing and saw nothing, so I breathed a sigh of relief as I could now see my house. I walked in and locked the door and saw my mom standing in the living room chatting on the phone. I'm trying to interrupt her conversation telling her about the weird guy in the red car, when for some reason she goes to the front window and peeks through the curtain and she takes the phone from her ear and says, What's that car? This is all in a minute since walking through the door and I'm thinking to myself it can't be him, because if he had followed me I would have heard the car. Before I even got a chance to look for myself, there's a knock at the front door. So I go to answer it, only pulling it open a few inches. And there is this guy standing there empty-handed wearing a baseball cap. It was the same guy in the car. I'm just like, what the fuck? I ask him if I can help him. Did you order a pizza? He asks me. And I'm like, no, I think you have the wrong house. Taking a step towards me, he says again in a not-fucking-around kind of tone. No. I said, did you order a pizza? Before I reply, my mom comes up behind me and opens the door fully and says, Is there a problem? This causes him to back up mumbling, I must have the wrong address, before he gets in his car and takes off. Sure to say, we were both a bit spooked and made sure everywhere was locked up properly. This happened in late 2015 into early 2016. At the time I was a single mom with two little boys. I had gotten a divorce in 2011 and decided to try to date again. Between working 40 hours a week and being a mom of two young kids, I didn't have time to go out and meet people. So I decided to try online dating. I made an account on Plenty of Fish. 
I had it for a while. I went on some good dates and some bad dates. The usual. I had a really cheap smartphone at the time, so apps kept crashing and I kept getting annoyed with it. I had a guy message me on this app and I stupidly gave him my number because I was going to delete the app. Let's call him Felipe. Our first few texts were normal. How are you? What are you into? Etc. I told him I have to drive to work and I'll talk to him later. He sent me a text saying, I want to be sweet to you. Which may not seem scary, but it made me really uncomfortable. I didn't know how to respond, so I just ignored it and went on with my day. The next afternoon, Felipe texted me a picture of himself with a black eye and said, I got into a fist fight at work today. Wish I had a sexy woman like you to ice it. I want to be sweet to you. I sent a text back saying, Sorry to hear that. Hope your day gets better. The next day, Felipe sends me another message saying, When are you going to let me be sweet to you? As I've said, I've just got bad vibes from him. I finally sent him a text back saying, To be honest with you, I don't think we're a good match. I apologize and wish you the best of luck. And Felipe lost his shit. From what I can remember, he sent a text back saying, How dare you? Why, because I have tattoos? You have a pretty face but an ugly heart. How dare you judge me? I, now laughing because I dodged a bullet, reply back, Well, for starters, it's not your tattoos. I have four. And after your response, I definitely stand by my decision. Felipe responds, No, I'm sorry. You made me feel ugly. I want to be sweet to you. I just ignored the text because at the time I had no idea how to block numbers. I went on with my life. Over the next few months I started dating Kevin, and I'd get the occasional, I want to be sweet to you, text. Then he'd call my phone and leave voicemails of him breathing. Then one day he texts me and says, I moved my V-Berg so I could be closer to you. When can I be sweet to you? Then another heavy breathing voicemail. I sent him a text saying, You need to stop contacting me. I have a boyfriend. Felipe replied, Who, Kevin? I'll be sweeter to you. I'm extremely creeped out now because I never told him my boyfriend's name. I assumed he found my Facebook and saw it there. I ignore the message. A few days go by and I'm at work. I'm a dog groomer and at the time I was working at a corporate store that had a big window so you could see inside the salon from inside the store. I was working on a dog and this feeling of dread came over me and I could feel someone watching me. I look up and see a man standing in the middle of an aisle looking right at me. Our eyes met and he gave me the biggest creepiest smile. It was Felipe. I quickly look down realizing who it is. He then comes and paces back and forth past the window. My coworker Kay says, Who's the creeper by the window? I said, Someone who I told to stay far away from me? I finished the dog I had on my table because his owner was waiting. I didn't see Felipe anymore, but I still paged my manager and let him know what was going on. I was closing that night so he told me he'd keep an eye out and make sure someone walks out with me. My shift comes to an end and I check my phone. There's a text from Felipe. I saw you today. I want to be sweet to you. I ignored it. My coworker B walked me to my car and I went home. I sent a message to my boyfriend who was on third shift telling him what had went on. He happened to call as soon as I was pulling into my apartment to make sure I was okay. I asked him to stay on the phone with me until I got inside. I'm on the ground floor and we just had a fresh snowfall, so I walked around checking around my windows for footprints, just in case he found my place. I didn't see anything, so I went inside. I get a message from my coworker B, who I closed with and walked me to my car. She told me that Felipe sent 
her a friend request. She wasn't even wearing a name tag that shift. I grabbed my phone and sent him a text in response to the one he had left me earlier that night and said, Do not contact me or come to my work. My father works for the police department and I have a boyfriend. You need to leave me alone. Felipe replied with, I just want to be sweet to you. I'll be waiting. It's been almost four years now. I'm still with Kevin and I haven't heard from Felipe since. It definitely could have been worse, but when he showed up at my work it was scary as hell. A little over a year ago I had a job overnight at a gas station close to my house. I'm a woman and was 31 at the time. I know to some it seems unsafe for a woman to work graveyard shift by herself. However, it was a slow store and the sheriff's office was about 20 feet across from it. I really didn't think I would have that many problems. There would be about 30 customers in an 8-hour shift and that was on a busier night. It was about 3.30 in the morning. I went outside to sweep the parking lot and last minute check the trash. It was time for a cigarette and I had my headphone in, kinda jamming out. Across the road in the parking lot of the sheriff's office, I saw a figure with his back to me. He was swaying back and forth while looking down. Honestly, it looked like he was enjoying a much needed piss. Against the sheriff's office though? Yeah, the building closes at 4 p.m. and doesn't open again till 6 in the morning. But why? By the back of his ripped white t-shirt, I remembered that he had come in about 4 hours earlier. He was a total creep and I could already tell he had a good buzz going. I don't say anything. I took my eyes off of him and tried not to draw attention to myself. It was working until the car pulled in. I was still outside as they pulled up and I saw him look at the car, look at me, and then back and forth. As the customer is leaving, I walk her outside. I still had half a smoke burning and I had left my dustpan outside with the squeegee. We both hear him start to swear angrily and seemingly engage in an argument with himself. She looks across the road and tells me to be careful. I make an awkward joke about him being the one who should be more afraid of me or something like that. The man is still there, but closer to the road, not facing the parking lot of my store. Whatever he's yelling, it's completely unintelligible. He's obviously very drunk and can barely stand straight up, still swaying away. I don't engage him, but I don't take my eyes off him either. I just slowly walked back into the store. Something about his face really bothered me. He had a darkness to his face, but his eyes looked wild. My experience during graveyard jobs had been that the crazy-eyed ones are the worst ones. I didn't like it at all, and I wanted no part of it. I still had almost three hours to go and two hours before any other employees got there. Instantly, I go to the computer and type up a temporary close sign just in case he wants trouble. I'm going around the counter on my way to the doors when I see that he's walked across the road to my side. I literally just barely get the second door locked when he stumbles into our very small parking lot. My hand makes the mimed hand signal for cut across the neck, basically saying, nope, sorry, you're not coming in here, we're closed. I shook my head back and forth, hoping to further discourage him. He starts walking away, but screams something at me while he's walking away. I don't mean he was grumpy and shouted at me or yelled that I was an asshole or anything. I mean like he was at an enraged volume and was violently throwing his hands everywhere. Definitely knowing I'm in the wrong shift of the wrong job, I got really skeeved out. I decided to call the cops. It's a good thing too because the minute I hung up with him, there he comes again to the door. He starts pulling on it and banging on it. He backs up and runs into it to try to ram into it. Not that it would have done any good. I made the mistake of telling him that I had called the cops and his ass was about to be grass. I say I made the mistake of telling him because once I said that he took off. 
the police never found him. They drove around the road and surrounding neighborhoods for over an hour but found no one. He was on foot, so I don't get where he could have gone to. He didn't harm me, and with them not finding him, I didn't file a police report or anything. I was safe behind the thick glass doors. It just sucked. Maybe if I didn't warn him ahead of time, I wouldn't have spent the last three months of my job constantly looking over my shoulder. I'll never know what the right choice was. I'm just glad I don't work there anymore. I'd like to start off by explaining my situation at the time. I was 15 and had begun hanging out with the wrong crowd. Guys far too old to be hanging out with me had gotten me into a plethora of drugs. I was on and off homeless and our days consisted of riding around town in the blistering summer heat to Walmart and other various stores to stock up on stolen goods. I had mentioned to two of my closest friends at the time that I knew something we could easily steal to get high on. We'll call them Caleb and Seth. I explained to them that a couple boxes of Benadryl would get us high off our asses. As per usual, we trekked up to Walmart and made a run, stealing some junk food and a couple boxes of Benadryl. After our score, we went to the back of the large building, knowing the trails and the train tracks were just around the corner. We made our way down the tracks to a sort of swampy area and made ourselves a spot to sit. I told them how much each of us would probably need to get a kick, and without hesitation we all popped a handful each. Now, this next part is a bit confusing as abusing this drug to get high makes you extremely delusional and hazy, but I remember we had all been sitting there about 20 minutes when it started to kick in. My thoughts would leave my head as quickly as they entered. I couldn't even keep my mind straight. Caleb was speaking to someone who wasn't there and standing up only to stumble around. Seth was handling it much better, but I could tell he was also getting woozy. Time seemed to pass never-endingly slow, but at the same time it seemed like I was coming in and out of consciousness like every ten minutes apart. My mind was racing. I remember touching pebbles and dirt on the mucky ground below me thinking I saw something that I needed to pick up, but I just couldn't. I recall Caleb wandering off claiming he had to use the washroom. Seth and I heard him talking to himself in the bush and falling over and almost getting into the marshy water. After Seth went to retrieve him, the next thing I remember is Caleb wandering into the water up to his knees and bending down in the water grasping at dirt settled at the bottom. I was sitting there in a confusion and daze, then stated I too needed to use the washroom and wandered off. After that I literally don't remember anything up until nightfall. I briefly remember I had taken off my shoes and socks, or lost my shoes then took my socks off too. I was running along the tracks barefoot, landing on each wooden rung across the bottom like a madman. I remember turning around and running back and forth for minutes at a time just up and down the tracks. I remember stopping abruptly on the tracks and bending down seeing my phone in its pink case laying there. I tried picking it up, but my hand went right through it. Again and again I tried picking it up, but I was only getting dirt. Eventually it clicked that there was no phone, and I moved on. The next two events, I'm not really sure in which order they occurred because my mind was so frazzled that night, but I'll relay them both the best I can. First I'll start with what else I remember happening on the tracks. As I continued to walk or run like a creepy weirdo back and forth on the tracks, I suddenly stopped at the sight of a huge black mass to the right of me in the bush. In my delirious state, I stopped and squinted my eyes straining to see what could have only been six feet in front of me. I heard it grunt. It was a massive black bear and to my horror, two smaller black masses were moving below her. For some goddamn reason, I just moved along and lo and behold, I forgot in my whacked out mind what I had just witnessed. I turned around as I had been doing for the past hours, pacing on those tracks and marched back in the direction of the bears. I remember passing it again, 
freezing, hearing its bluff, and then running. I finally realized what danger I might have been in and made my way out of there somehow. I don't recall much because my consciousness kind of came in waves. The next thing I can recall I was walking down a dark paved dead end road, and there were only houses on one side. I was glancing around in my paranoia when I heard a familiar voice call my name from a house with its lights on. I heard loud music coming from it as I got closer and closer. As I approached the door the music stopped. It reminded me of my grandparents' house as I entered. I recall asking myself if it really was okay to come in when I heard another invitation from my friend asking me to join her. I stumbled through the slightly open door to a hallway and a doorway and took a right into the doorway which turned out to be this guy's living room. I have to mention that I'm a huge animal lover and have a black lab that's been my best friend for 13 years. So when I entered this man's living room and saw a goofy looking black lab with huge floppy ears and a wagging tail, naturally the first thing I did was sit on the plush carpet next to her and began petting her and playing with her ears. She didn't seem to mind at all that I was intruding. Suddenly, as I'm patting his dog on the head, the house owner comes out of the hallway and stares at me in horror. What are you doing in my house? He questioned me sternly. I don't remember what my reply was, or if I even replied at all. I remember him telling me to get out, and I obliged. He followed me out the way I came in all the way to the end of his driveway, again asking me, What were you doing in my house? I think I remember him asking me if I needed an ambulance or a taxi or something, and I refused. As I began to walk away, he spat, Don't come back to my house. I told him I wouldn't. All I remember next was beginning to sober up, walking and shivering on the cold pavement in only a t-shirt and leggings. Though it was summertime, I live in Canada and it gets very cold at night, regardless of the season. I looked up ahead of me and see the welcome to blank sign. I had been out of town. I walked so far up and down those train tracks I ended up outside of town. I was hours away from my home at the time, a makeshift bed under a set of stairs near my mother's house. As what had really happened all that night began to set in, A miracle of some sort landed upon me. Two young women pulled over seeing the fact I had almost no clothes on and no shoes and was walking alone at night, and it must have been 5 a.m. They asked me if I needed a ride, and I insisted I didn't. But they told me they were safe people and were concerned for my safety. So I agreed and got in. They brought me right to where I was staying and I thanked them profusely before they drove off. This is by far the worst trip and drug experience I've ever had. There were so many scenarios where I could have lost my life or worse, but some kind of luck I held with me that night saved my ass. I am now 17 and clean and I live a happier life away from that town. Before I start this story, I want to give a little bit of backstory. Growing up as a girl, I learned from a young age that danger can be lurking around any corner. When I was 12 years old, my mom and I were at Best Buy looking for Christmas presents for my dad. During our time there shopping, something happened that changed my life forever. Without realizing it, a man had walked up next to me and began trying to get my attention. Luckily, it didn't take long for my mom to notice the man's strange behavior. She quickly grabbed my hand and led me to the checkout line, not caring if she grabbed the right movie for my dad. We were walking out of the store in less than 10 minutes and that's when we saw multiple police cruisers parked in the fire lane right in front of the store entrance. The same man that my mom had pulled me away from was leaning over the hood with his hands cuffed behind his back as the officers prepared to load him up. My mom never reported anything to the police since the man was already being arrested. She thought him acting strange wasn't worth reporting since she didn't know the reason for his arrest, and nothing had happened to me. 
Or at least that's what she thought until two police officers showed up at her house soon after that day. The lead officer's name was Sean Potter. He was a sergeant with the Detective Division of Robbery and Homicide Unit, which served with the Domestic Violence and Sex Crimes Unit in the ACCPD. We were informed that they were reviewing Best Buy security cameras. They saw the man inappropriately touch multiple children that day in the store before his arrest. They also saw that he had exposed himself to me when my mom wasn't looking. They said by the way he was behaving, it looked like he was trying to lure me away from my mom. Fifteen years later, I still can't remember everything that happened. That's partly because of my brain repressing some of the memories from the traumatic event, and other part is the fact that I didn't realize what was going on. What twelve-year-old would? I still wonder to this day what he was going to do to me after he successfully lured me away. That wasn't the first or the last time I would be a targeted victim, or be involved in some sort of way. It's happened a couple of times since that's helped fuel my crippling anxiety and PTSD. So, even at the age of 27, I'm still too scared to wander off alone without someone and avoid walking anywhere at night. If I'm going on my own, whether I'm running to the store or going for a walk on the trails at a local park, I'm always prepared to defend myself. Sometimes I'll carry three or four options for self-defense. A knife, taser, pepper spray, and a crowbar in my car. Yeah, I know. It's overkill. But you also have to understand I'm 4 foot 11 and hardly over 100 pounds. So even though I could go Mike Tyson on a bitch and rip off someone's ear if I was attacked, I know I can only do so much damage with my size. But I'm at a turning point in my life where I'm trying to face my fears and anxiety. A little after Hurricane Irma hit Florida in September 2017, it became a slow-moving tropical storm and then a depression by the time it hit my home in Athens, Georgia. It brought several hours of heavy rain with strong wind gusts that reached 40 through 50 miles per hour. The wind wasn't too bad, but the rain was horrible. We were already having a wet summer, about twice more than we usually get. Since our area is used to getting droughts, the soil doesn't handle that much rain very well. It didn't take long before the trees started blowing down. I remember my husband and I sitting under the carport as we heard numerous trees crash down and transformers on power lines explode. Fast forward to the next week. I was hauling all the large tree branches that littered our property with my RAV4. It was dusk and the sun had just fully sunk behind the horizon, but there was still just enough light for me to hook up my last haul. Before I began, my husband left to go pick up takeout, seeing as I had been working most of the day in the yard. It had been nearly 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 Celsius, that day, so I was exhausted from the heat. But worst of all, it was also humid. Summers in the southern United States are always really hot and humid. September was always awful. When I moved my SUV to the other side of the property where the woods began, I left the headlights on and brought a flashlight with me just to make sure I could see well. The last thing I wanted was to step on one of six venomous snakes we have here. Within minutes it was nighttime, and besides what my headlights shined on, the forest was pitch black, and it seemed like none of my neighbors were home. It was the weekend and there was a football game in town. Athens is known for its large university and football team. As soon as I stepped out of my vehicle, I was on edge and felt like I was being watched. Until now, I've never willingly stepped a foot in the woods alone at night before. I've always been too scared to. I mentally acknowledged that it was probably just my anxiety trying to get the best of me, so I just tried to push the feeling away. But just as I finished fastening the remaining branches together to hook to my SUV, I suddenly saw a flashlight shining through the woods. Even though they were only about a hundred yards away, and I could tell that they were in the neighbor's yard, I shined my light back at the person, acknowledging that I had seen them. I thought it was just a neighbor maybe checking on something that looked weird or out of place. The house we had just moved into had previously been empty for over a year after the last stoner moved out and listed it for sale. 
Maybe they just didn't realize we had moved in two months ago. Now thinking back, that was stupid. Who wouldn't realize someone had moved in almost two months ago? As I watched the light begin to move, I could hear footsteps slowly making their way through the thick underbrush, just on the edge of the woods. I stood there for a few seconds and then flashed my light off and then back on, trying to get some kind of reaction or response from the stranger. They stopped walking before copying me. On. Off. A few seconds ticked by before the light came back on. And then went off. I waited for the light to come back on, but it never did. As soon as I heard the footsteps continue making their way towards me again, all the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. Now it felt like they were messing with me. Without meaning to, my internal thoughts slipped out of my mouth. Nah, fuck that. I instantly dropped everything I had and quickly went to my car. I promptly locked all the doors after I jumped in and dialed my husband. I was too scared to drive my SUV to the driveway. I feared they would have enough time to make their way to the entrance of our house and find a hiding spot before jumping me. I had heard of many people being surprised while getting out of their cars. I called my husband at least five times, but he never picked up. He was probably inside picking up our food and had left his phone in the car. I debated on calling the police, but I was worried about overreacting. I would be so embarrassed calling the police for nothing. I also thought about leaving, but I knew my dog and cat were inside and I couldn't just leave them. The door in the garage was also unlocked, giving the man easy access to the house. My anxiety was giving me anxiety at this point. Our backyard fence was right up against these woods and the security light was on, lighting up half of the yard. I checked around my SUV three times to make sure the person hadn't already snuck up on me when I wasn't looking. Then I searched our backyard. I didn't see anyone or any movement, and knew that now was my chance to go. I get out, locked my vehicle, and began making my way to the house. I didn't run since the house wasn't too far away and I would rather be able to hear the slightest noise nearby. But I for sure didn't take my time. I glanced behind me at the spot where I had last seen the light in the surrounding area. Nothing. Now I was feeling crazy and confused. I looked back to our backyard and the mysterious light was suddenly right behind the chain link fence. The light was above the person so I couldn't actually see who it was. The fence was only 100 feet from me and the figure was tall, at least 6 feet, and had broad shoulders. Right away I was able to tell that the silhouette was of a man. With the way he was holding up his flashlight the bright light made it impossible to see his face, and he was of course just out of reach of the security light. I didn't say a thing or even scream. I just booked it. I actually ran so fast I had almost tripped over my own work boots. It almost felt like my legs were running faster than the rest of me. I now get why people fall so much in horror movies. As I was about to bust through the door in our carport, I thought of something over all the panic and adrenaline. The back door that leads into the backyard was unlocked. I crashed through the door before slamming the door closed. I locked the door and sprinted through our house. I ran into the kitchen island, knocking over things I had just unpacked. But it didn't slow me down, nor did the sounds of things falling and breaking. My boots were probably muddy and no fucks were given as I ran through the white carpeted living room. I quickly locked the door and then looked outside the window. Nothing. There was no light or man to be found. I stood there for a good minute or two, waiting. Again, nothing. I went around the house checking each window and door at least twice before I finally heard my husband. When he called, my ringtone nearly made me piss myself. He calmed me down and got home as soon as he could. 
He said it was probably nothing and was just a neighbor. I left my car and tools in the yard until the next morning. After a long night of little sleep, I went to retrieve my things. Once I was done, I decided to go to my neighbors to see if it was one of them. Maybe I was just being too paranoid. One by one, they responded with confused faces and then concern. I called the police to make a report. Even the officer looked confused. He said the most I could do was just keep an eye out and keep everything locked up even when I'm home just in case. But that was it. There wasn't really anything they could do. I'm guessing it was somebody trying to break in since everything began happening once my husband was gone. The timing was too perfect. It was like he waited for him to leave. The flashlight is a good way to distract or confuse someone too, and with the light pointing at me I couldn't identify him. I read in a local paper about it happening to a woman who was almost raped after someone tried breaking into her home. All of it was scary, but the worst part was the fact I hadn't seen his face. I have no idea who this man is or what his intentions truly were. I could have passed by this person on the street and I would have no clue it was them. Nothing else happened, but it didn't make me feel any better. I didn't sleep well for weeks and had trouble going out for a cigarette once it was dark. So I was left confused, without answers and with more anxiety. Just like before in Best Buy, I felt like prey and wondered what would have happened if they had gotten their hands on me. I know it may just seem like an experience that someone can move past, but it's not that easy for me. It's been almost a year and a half since it's happened and I still get uneasy being outside at night when I have to put up my chickens. Luckily we're moving in a month so I can finally feel at ease. Again, I know it's important to face your fears, but just realize that sometimes there are things you should be scared of. Please be safe out there. And if you get a gut feeling, just listen to it. I would rather feel stupid later on than wishing I had listened to myself. Better safe than sorry. It's difficult to put this into words. I think we're all naive enough at some point to think you could never know someone like who I'm about to tell you about. I won't say his name, so I'll just call him Gary. Gary and I worked together at a fast food place a long time ago. He was always an oddball who was made fun of a lot by other co-workers. Even his own parents made fun of him, or at least his father did anyway. He never had any luck with women, and even into his mid-thirties I don't think he ever even had a girlfriend. I know that seems weird to bring up, but that could partially explain the story. After a while, Gary was either fired or told to quit because several girls we worked with had multiple complaints, and it was all for the same thing. We had a bulletin board at work where employees would put their phone numbers to ask for more hours if anyone called off or if they just didn't want to work. Gary would get their numbers and call and text them to ask them out. Naturally, they all bitched about him, telling him that's not appropriate and not the reason they put their numbers up. So, thanks to him, no one, even male employees, were allowed to put their numbers up on the bulletin board anymore. I eventually quit that job and we went our separate ways, but stayed friends on Facebook. I'd even see him in person from time to time when I was out paying bills or running other errands. He started doing freelance photography out of his home, and thought he had finally found his calling. He would do some wedding and prom photos, and they started getting better in terms of production and photo quality. He seemed to be doing really well for himself. That is until late October, early November 2018. I hadn't heard from him in a while and thought he was keeping a low profile because of his political views and it being right before the midterms. A friend of mine, who also happens to be an ex-co-worker of both of us, shared an article on Facebook detailing the arrest of a local man on child pornography charges. I thought nothing of it. 
I was glad they caught the sicko and didn't click on the article because who the hell wants to read the details of someone that heinous? A few more days go by and I'm wondering why I haven't heard or seen from Gary on his Facebook for a while. So being curious I went to his profile and the very first thing that comes up is a post that's getting a lot of angry reactions and blown up with comments calling him a pedophile. At this point I still hadn't put two and two together. Call me dense. Thankfully it only took a couple of minutes for me to put the pieces together. And my heart sank. I went back to the article that the other friend had shared with me and clicked on it. Sure enough, he's the one who was arrested. Turns out he had been under FBI surveillance for at least nine months before they raided his home and business. He engaged in the solicitation and enticement of children, and also sought out to have sex with children on film. On top of the 200 pictures on his computer, including edited photos of children being molested, beaten, and killed. And to top it all off, he was using legitimate pictures of his client's own kids, photoshopping them to make them look like they were in inappropriate situations. I instantly went back to his profile and blocked him immediately. Not that it would do much, considering if he ever does get out of prison, he will probably never be allowed to access a camera or another recording device, or probably even the internet, ever again. To my knowledge, he never succeeded in doing anything to anyone's child, and I'm grateful for that. I hope the parents of all the kids who realized what he was doing can rest easier. They'll probably never use a freelance photographer ever again, and I can't blame them. I hope I never hear about or see that sick bastard ever again. Just for reference, I'm a 22-year-old male, living in the Midwestern Tri-State area. The events being told are true to the best of my knowledge. On what seemed at first to be just another night hanging out at my best friend's house doing what a lot of early 20-something-year-olds do for fun, Netflix, Xbox, drinking, etc., turned into something neither of us expected. The two of us were just hanging out playing Call of Duty when we got bored with it. We had some extra cash and he suggested the idea of buying some cheap gas station wine and getting wine drunk and watching a movie or something. I thought this was a great idea and affirmed his request, so we climbed into the man van and took off. We were crossing the Mississippi River when at the end we saw some police cruisers with their lights flashing. They were in a parking lot of a small shopping mall by the edge of town, close to the bridge. We noticed that there was police tape encircling a medium-sized portion of the parking lot, and that one of those heavy steel public trash bins had been struck with by what seemed to be a car. We'd been having really icy weather, so we figured a car had just slid into the trash bin and either took off or the police had already taken care of it and were just finishing up the paperwork and whatnot. My buddy and I got our wine, and on the way back to his place, noticed the police had left, which seemed to confirm our suspicions. Fast forward to the next day, watching the news. I found out how wrong we had been. The cops, the police tape... None of it had to do with a simple car accident. Come to find out in that same parking lot a woman was stabbed several times by her estranged boyfriend. The knockdown and bent trash bin was from the same boyfriend running her down after she tried to get away. Two of her four children were in the car with him. The woman succumbed to her wounds in the hospital but was able to give the details of her attacker to a witness before she died. The boyfriend was quickly apprehended and is facing life in prison for first-degree murder. The murder had happened just an hour and a half or less from when my buddy and I drove past the crime scene. While the town in question does have the most crime in the state, it's mostly property crime and murder is extremely rare. A couple of my friends had known or were friends with the poor young woman. The dirtbag that had done it had effectively orphaned their children. Justice will be served, but it's hard to say there's any real justice for those children.
It was a hot summer day in the Bible Belt of the southern United States, and my sister and I were playing outside. This is one of the few fond memories I have of us playing like children together, because at the time I was about six years old and she was eleven or twelve. A budding preteen who would soon have no interest in playing such childlike games with her little sister. Eventually the heat became unbearable, and since we were too poor to have a pool or spend a day at a water park, we convinced our father to play with the water hose. Fortunately our mother was at work, so she was not there to object and my father, too exhausted from being away for several days for his job, agreed. Ecstatic, we changed into some old loose play clothes and happily ran outside. We had fun spraying each other and running around in the misty rain for about an hour before our clothes became too wet and heavy to bear, and we sat on the front porch steps, resting in the shade, and watching the cars drive to and fro on the back road about 30 feet from our home. Soon, a slow-driving beige car came to a halt in front of our mailbox and paused there for a moment. We quietly watched it like alert deer until the driver finally rolled the window down. He was a man, seemingly in his mid-twenties with dark, sun-kissed skin and an unkempt afro. He was wearing a long-sleeved, thin, white button-up shirt. He casually rested his arm on the car door and poked his head out flashing a smile that even for the South seemed too friendly towards a couple of strangers, and said, How are you ladies doing? Good? We politely responded, the teachings of our parents to respect our elders deeply ingrained in us. Now, I was a very sweet child, but I often had mean and almost adult-like thoughts reverberating through my mind, so it was no surprise to me that my first thought was, why does he sound like a little bitch? I did not immediately notice that he was speaking in a slightly higher pitched tone, hence why his voice cracked a little mid-sentence. Is your daddy home? He asked in the same tone. My father was well known in this community, so it was not uncommon for him to get the occasional random visitors when he was home. We said yes, but he was sleeping and asked him if he wanted us to wake our dad up. No, no, that's fine, he quickly insisted. But we stood up, saying it was no problem and he wouldn't be grouchy if we woke him up. Before we even opened our front gate, he sped off, his car audibly straining from how hard he pressed down the gas pedal. I looked at my sister wide-eyed, still trying to make sense of what had just happened. My sister, a sense of realization and adrenaline briefly flashing across her eyes, looked at me with a soft smile and said, we should go inside. I was a little dejected, but deep down I firmly understood the importance of her words, and we went inside and told our father. His groggy expression furrowed into a familiar upset yet protective expression and he firmly commanded us to shower and continue playing inside. I am very happy that our father was just a short call away. I do not want to think about what would have happened if he hadn't been home. Strangely enough, this is not where the story ends. A few years later, it was my 11th birthday. I had not seen the creepy man since, and he is tucked away in my memories. My mother had planned a surprise birthday party in the fellowship hall of my church, and she'd asked my sister to keep me occupied all day until everything was in place. I was pretty gullible, so I was oblivious to the party until I was greeted with the pleasant surprise in the hall entrance. Funnily enough, I did not really enjoy the party. My parents did not know much about my interest or my friends, so they just invited children from the neighborhood who I didn't really talk to, except on the school bus. They were snobby brats who obviously showed up just for the free food their parents promised them. In addition, there were equally as many people 7 through 15 years older than me who had no business being there other than to pretend to join in the festivities just to scoff down some hot dogs and cake. I was annoyed, and just ate and drank as much as I could and acted generally cold to most of the guests, in hopes of warding them off and cutting the party short. After unwrapping the gifts, I took the freedom from my birthday obligations to wander around and chat with my sister. In the middle of our conversation, she paused, her eyes fixed on the corner of the fellowship hall. 
I followed her gaze and landed on a man with dark sun-kissed skin and a shaved head. That's him, she said in a low voice, despite us being in the very center of a giant room, far from ear's reach. Though her words were vague, my soul immediately understood just who him was. And instead of fear or urgency, I felt anger. My sister was slightly shook, but brushed off how she felt. However, I was pissed and wanted to confront him somehow. She urged me not to make a scene, but I ignored her and angrily stomped towards him until I was just a mere six feet from him. I was pissed, but I wasn't stupid. What was I supposed to say to him anyway? It had been so long ago and everyone would likely just brand me as mental. So I glared at him, with tight lips and my most furious and disappointed expression. I glowered at him for what felt like five minutes. He never even looked at me. He just stared at the floor with a deeply troubled expression. I began to pick up on some unresolved sadness radiating from him, but I did not care. This was a children's party and it was clear that he was out of place and not meant to be there. And soon I watched him get up and leave the building, never returning. After that interaction, I had perked up a little and continued to enjoy the party with my sister. We never spoke about him again. We didn't need to. For some reason, I was satisfied with it all, for it felt like it was finally a chapter in my life I could close. Additionally, perhaps I somehow prevented him from taking advantage of another child. I have not seen the man since. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a like, subscribe, share it with your friends, all that good stuff. Not like it's really going to matter because YouTube is kind of crazy at the moment, but it is what it is. Hit the notification button. Just do it. Yes. Do it really good. Yes. I hope everyone's having a great day, and I really do appreciate you checking out this video. And if you would like to help support the channel, make sure you check out my Patreon page, get yourself some cool perks. And if you would like to submit your own story, email it to yourmaker6260 at gmail.com. I will catch you all in the next video. And just remember, it's always scarier if it's true. Bad bye.